got your Bibles with me with you this morning, I want you to go ahead and open them up. Taking a break from a sermon series for a little bit, just trusting the Lord that He will, uh, and He has given us exactly what we need this morning. But I want to address a topic that, as a pastor, you know, we have gone through several things the last several months, and a lot of you are still going through things this morning. And so I want to encourage you with this topic this morning. We're going to talk about what we do when hardships hit. When hardships hit. And some of you have been getting hit and punched and beat and kicked. And you're wondering when this is going to stop. You're wondering why is this happening. And so this morning, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we're going to try to encourage you with the Word of God. So at some point, if you're here and, and maybe you're not the person we're talking to, you can just hang on because you'll be able to go back and view this marriage when your hardship comes. You'll be able to, to view this sermon, see it in your marriage, see it in your home, see it with your children. You're going to see it. You're going to see it. And when you do, you can go back and hit the rewind. And you can watch this as well. But for those of us at some point, every one of us are going to go through some type of hardships. And these hardships have different effects on, on people. Some embrace, some isolate, some question, some draw closer to God, some fall away. But the fact remains this morning that none of us in this room, none of us that will watch this are exempt. We're not exempt from getting hit with hardships. You know, I'm reminded of a marriage that started out so beautiful, but through the busyness of life, how he changed the way he responded to her. The changes in desire for wealth brought so much disappointment, which allowed anger and frustrations to creep in, and communication became less and less. Depression slipped in, and now they're wondering if things will ever go back to what they once were. I'm also reminded this morning of a Christian family who was so strong in the Lord at one time. They raised their children to love Jesus, and unfortunately, one of their children found a new set of friends her senior year of high school, and she walked away from everything she knew, leaving a mom and a dad feeling defeated and questioning where they went wrong, questioning if, if God was ever listening or is listening or if God was even really there, if he's there now. Think about another young man this morning who had a terrible childhood. Parents who struggled with addiction his entire life. A young man who swore with everything that he had he'd never be like them. Ended up with a great job and he was climbing the corporate ladder at a rapid pace until one day the company decided to go into a, a different direction and he lost his job. That loss brought back those childhood feelings of failure and discouragement which led him down a road, the same road as his parents, into a life of addiction. And then there's some of those that I'm reminded of this morning who were just walking through life. And one day, out of nowhere, they received news from the doctors that changed everything. Each one of these examples of people find themselves asking the same questions at some point. Question like, does God really love me? Does he, does he really care about me? And if God does love me, then why did this happen? What, what's he up to? Is he punishing me? Are my children going through this because God's punishing me? What have I done wrong? And if you say God loves me, Pastor, and He does care about me, what does that actually look like? How's it supposed to look? So often someone will step up and they'll chime in with, Romans 8 and 1, and they'll say the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. And that's true. That's a true statement. Then someone else will chime in with another verse that's 
even more known in Romans 8, 28. And they'll say, well, you know, for those who love God, all things work together for those for the good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And we listen to that scripture, but we walk away feeling more confused than we really were in the beginning. And the question becomes, what is the purpose? What is God's purpose for all this? So often the true purpose is really not in Romans 8, 28, but in 8 and 29. The purpose of any hardship or any suffering we go to is so that we can be conformed to the image of Christ. So today for these next few moments, I, I want to give you seven things that I feel like will help those of us who are being hit with hardships. So let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to do a work in our hearts and our minds this morning that only He's capable of doing. Let's pray. Lord, today we love you. What an incredible time of worship. God, there are people in the room right now, people watching online who are going through some incredible seasons of life. People, men and women and students who who know what the Word says. They know what you say. But so oftentimes we find ourselves questioning and wondering. And so this morning, God, as we talk about these hardships and the suffering that we go through at times, Lord, I just pray that you get glory. Nothing else but you, nobody else but you gets glory uh, through this time that we spend together. And God, I pray that this morning some healing can begin when we understand uh, the why or the purpose based on your scriptures and based on how you've led us to this point of our lives. So God, give us what you would have us to say this morning. And I pray, Father, right now that we just all are drawn closer to you with a heart to speak the name of Jesus, to remember that our Jesus does change our lives. And today, God, if there's anybody in this room or watching online who is looking for a change of life, I pray that your name is at the forefront of their mind and heart today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The first thing I want you to see this morning as you go through hardships of what the purpose of any hardship is, I want you to see that the purpose of a hardship can enhance you. It can enhance you. I believe God uses a hardship in the life of a believer to enhance their relationship with God, to deepen it, and to make it stronger. And for those of you who, for just a moment, would say, Pastor, I am better, because you'll have a choice to be bitter or better. Those of you who chose to be better, I think you would boldly testify this morning that you are better. You are better because of how and what God has brought you through. But I want to give you two examples this morning of that in the scriptures because that's where I'm going to go. We want to ask a question about why God does something. We're going to turn to the scriptures to answer that. In 2 Chronicles 28 verse 22, it has to do with an Israelite king named Ahaz. And it says this about Ahaz. In his time of trouble, he became even more unfaithful to the Lord. In his time of trouble, he became even more unfaithful to the Lord. Here's a guy facing a hardship, military threats of invasion. The bad guys are coming in. Instead of turning to the Lord, guess what he does? Look at the scriptures. He turned farther away from God. And if you flip in your scriptures just a few pages, you were to read through that passage in Chronicles just a little further, and you'd find yourself in chapter 33. It says something about another king, a different king, an evil king. In fact, among the worst kings ever. His name was King Manasseh. And it says in 2 Chronicles 33 and 12, in his distress, listen to the language, in his distress, 
Almost exactly the same verbiage as it said about the, uh, the previous king, but in his distress, which was similar to the distress of Ahab five chapters earlier, in his distress he sought the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his ancestors. The same kind of hardships. You can either go left or you can go right. We have an example of two kings who, were, who they believe were at the top of their game. They were at the top of the chain. They found themselves in a hardship. Listen, I just want to say to you this morning, the Word of God is true. The rich and the poor, He's the maker of them both. So you find yourselves at a crossroads a lot of times, just like these two kings. They could go one way or the other. The one thing about Manasseh's repentance, it's really a, a celebratory event, I believe, because as long as we can look at somebody as evil as Manasseh, as long as we can look at somebody like Saul in the New Testament who later became Paul, I just believe if you can see those two lives and see what God did in their lives, it doesn't matter if you're the worst of sinners, the worst prodigal, because if God can divert or convert those two guys in the Old and the New Testament, there's hope. There is hope. And so no matter what the hardship is for you, there's hope. But I believe through the hardship that God can enhance and will enhance you. I believe he'll make you better. Throughout the book of Psalms, what, what we consistently see is suffering and pressure and hardships. But what do we see from the psalmist? We see the psalmist crying out to God. We see him moving toward God. And can I just ask you this morning, are we any different? Are we any different? Hardships are hardships. Suffering is suffering. But in those moments, there becomes a choice. You, become, you, you get at the fork in the road or you get at the crossroads to where you can either run to God or you can run further from God. Could it be that one reason God has allowed this hardship is to encourage you, to draw you, to invite you to a deeper faith or a deeper response to Him that, that you would learn or that we would learn to go to Him in the midst of the struggle? Could it possibly be that He's trying to enhance our relationship with Him? Because most of us, when we think about grace, we, we usually just think about saving grace. And I just want to say to you this morning, the idea of grace is not merely forgiving grace. The New Testament has a rich use of the word grace for enabling grace, empowering grace, sustaining grace, strengthening grace. And that's what, that's what 2 Corinthians 12 through 9 verse, verse 9 and 10 is all about. Listen to what Paul said. Three times I plead, pleaded with the Lord about this that it should leave me. He had a, a thorn in his flesh. It wasn't a salvation he was praying about. It wasn't about forgiveness that he was seeking. He had a thorn in his flesh. He had a hardship. He had a difficult season he's going through. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this that it should lead me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in, of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses. I am content with insults. I'm content with hardships. I'm content with persecution and calamities. Look at what he says. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Most of us live on the other side of the fence. On the other side of the tracks, because when we feel like we're weak, we just see no opportunity to be strong. Could it be as you think about what you're going through in your life or what you've just come out of or what you're headed into? That one reason God allowed this is to bring you closer to Him. To enhance your life. I believe the second thing he wants us to see when we go through hardships, and this is pretty cool because I really, I'm really proud of myself. This is a good pride, right? Because I know certain people like Kelly Laminack is going to appreciate that all seven of these points start with the letter E. <laughs> and some of you others in here will too. But I believe the second thing that, that Christ wants us to see during a, a hardship, I believe he wants to give us experience. I believe he wants to give us some experience. 
you, you, you know that this, let's just get real, relate, real relatable right here in this moment. Some of us in the room, you say this to me all the time. I ain't real good at reading the book and following instruction, but if you'll show me one time, I can do it. If you'll show me one time, I can do it. What if we had that same attitude with God? God, you showed me this 127 times, and I just can't figure it out. Maybe he's wanting us to have the experience we need, and there's a purpose for that. I believe God uses our hardships to help us experience, listen, Christ's sufferings. It's hard to, to speak to something you've never gone through, right? We live in a culture today who they're not really interested in anything you've got to say, especially if they know you've never gone through this. We spend five hours at the jail yesterday preaching the gospel. But it's hard for me to relate to being in jail because I've never been. It's hard, me, hard for me to speak to addiction, drug addiction, because I've never been. But the moment one of those other gentlemen step up and they're tatted up from head to toe, they talk about the moment that they got arrested or the 28 felonies that they have, that all the things that they've got, the moment that they begin to speak, everybody's listening. Everybody's listening. Because it's hard to speak and someone to receive something from you when you, you've never gone through it. When we want answers, we want to talk to someone who's lived it. I love what Philippians 3 says. It's a passage that I've always found interesting. And Paul talks about his past and his prior state of his religious self-righteousness and, and how he threw all that away. He threw it all away. Listen to what verse 10 says in Philippians chapter 3. He threw it all away. Listen to what he says. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Listen, and he says this. And may share his sufferings becoming like him. In death, li listen to, to my prayer. Let's just get real. Lord, I'll take two out of the three, but I don't want to have to deal with that last one. Lord, I, I'm, I'm good with this, this passage right here, God. I want to I know you. God, I want to know the power of the resurrection, but Lord, I don't want to share in any suffering. It's not what Paul was saying. Can I know Christ and the power somehow, but not do the suffering? I think God's answer to us is, is this. It's a package deal. I really think it's a package deal. You know, it's amazing. Like We save money if we just package everything up. We're getting our insurance quoted right now. And they're like, can you just like put everything in a package? The house and the auto and all, everything you want. Let's just put it in a package because it's better when it's a package deal, right? Man, we get excited when we save money because of a package deal. But when it comes to the things of Christ and he says, I want you to know me. I want you to know the power of the name of Jesus and that resurrection. But I also want you to share in the sufferings because you need to experience that. And through that, it's going to enhance your life. I'm not here to imply that we're going to ever suffer to the level or in the same way that Jesus did. But I am going to remind you of this. It was the cross, then the crown. It was the suffering, then the glory. And I don't think things are going to be any different from us. I think of our Lord in Matthew 23 as he comes to the city. and He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often I've longed to gather your children together as, as a hen gather her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. And then in Luke's gospel, he tells us that Christ comes to the city and he weeps over the city. If only you knew what I had for you is basically what Jesus is saying there. But you've rejected it. The sufferings of Christ, he came into his own. His own did not receive him. And, and in Isaiah 53, 3, he says this, the man of sorrows and I, acquainted with grief. He has his very closest friends, his three closest friends that he chooses. And he invites them to go to a place of prayer with him and they, and they fall asleep with him. They fall asleep on him. And what he wanted them to do was experience him. He wanted them to experience him. 
You know, this morning, I think Christ wants us to experience Him. Peter later tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. Arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Why is it do you think that a lot of times, I I had to get corrected the other day, uh, Grant's been going through a season, a difficult season as a a 19-year-old, one that I I didn't go through at 19. And so immediately I, I started um, I started wearing that. Just being transparent with you. I'm like, God, what have I done for you to punish my kid? What have I done? And I even made this statement. I said, I think he's going through it. I think he's going through it because of me. Maybe it's an attack on me. Maybe God's trying to get, get my attention. I, I don't know, but he's got it. And it was in that moment where, you know, when our pastoral team, Kelly, came up to me and said, hey, I feel like the Lord has a word for you, and I, I think you're going about this the wrong way. I think you're going about this with the wrong thought. And she said, you know, Grant's a grown, he's grown, and he, he's got he's to work out his salvation and maybe just be all about him. Don't wear that label. But in that moment, let me tell you what it did do for me. It forced me back into the Word of God to dig, to dig, to dig. God, why did you want me to experience this? Why are me and Wanda experiencing this? It drove me to the Word of God and it allowed me to compare my life up against the Word of God. Search me, O God. Search me, O God, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Say, well, it's all about this grant going through this. Well, it may be. Certainly wouldn't deny that. But just speaking from, from where your pastor is, it forced me to look at my life, take a hard look at my life. Peter goes on to verse chapter 4, verse 12. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. We know that there's nothing that's uncommon to man, that everything that happens, Corinthians teaches this, we'll see this in just a moment, that there's nothing that happens that's not uncommon to man. Things, you're not in this alone. No matter where you are in your hardship, we're not in this alone. You're not in this alone. This leads me to that third point. I believe sometimes God allows us to be hit with hardships to expose, to expose sin in our life, to expose areas we're, we're not measuring up to the Word of God. Say, so, Pastor, how are you going to give me a scripture with this? If you were an Israelite, if you were an Israelite and you had gone through the 40 years in the desert experience and you look back on those 40 years, you might conclude that that was the worst, most horrible 40 years of your life. But it's interesting when you look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, God gives a different perspective with this. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2, it says, And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. What? Lord, the last 40 years of my life have been like this, and you did this to see if what was really in my heart? I will say this, John Ellis has no idea what kind of faith John Ellis has until John Ellis' faith is put to the test, and neither do you. We can talk, as they would say in our culture today, we can can talk smack all day long. We can stand and shout hallelujah and praise and have an incredible time of worship. But what happens when the hardships hits over at your house? 
Because they do. God uses it to expose, I believe, our sin. He did that with the children of Israel. He saw within his people a mixture of faith and unbelief, a mixture of obedience and disobedience. And and God allowed them to go through those 40 years to show them or to show him, but also to show them what was really going on in their hearts. And it's so easy to say, well, God knows my heart. God knows my heart. Yes, he does. But he also knows everything else about your life. And if you do anything or know anything about counseling, or if you've ever gone to counseling, which is a great thing for you to do if you need it. But I want to encourage you with this. The key to counseling is a a counselor to lead you to self-discovery. To where you discover what's really going on. What's really the, the root of this problem. And so sometimes God exposes us to these hardships so that we will see. He already sees, but so we will see. David Powelson said this, Often our typical sin emerge, sins, often our typical sins emerge in reaction to betrayal, loss, or pain. Hammered by some evil, we discover the evils in our own hearts. And perhaps most often, in the hands of our kind and purposeful father, the bad and the good both come out. A trial brings out what is most wrong in you, and God brings out what is most right as he meets you and works with you right where you are. When you look back at the life of Job and all that he went through, the heart of Job's wife was exposed, but the heart of Job was also exposed. The Bible says in Job chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. The hardship was overwhelming. Curse God and die. And he says to her, You speak as one of the, the foolish women. You speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. But in the beginning, in Job chapter 1, he says this, Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with the wrong. But there were a lot of things exposed. Some people say it this way. It's in situations like this where you find out or see someone's true colors. Or their true faith. When God exposes sin or things in our life, we can always end up with with something better. A a deeper relationship with Christ and a recognition of our own failures. And hear my heart on this. If you're here this morning and you're you're in that season, we we hadn't got to all the good yet, right? You're saying, Pastor, you're not really encouraging with this yet. You're not encouraging me. I want to encourage you with this. Repentance is always at the door. Repentance is always at the door to renew the joy of grace, to to renew the joy of forgiveness, to renew the joy of the Spirit. And if you truly know Christ, to renew the joy of His salvation. Repentance is at the door. The fourth thing I want you to see about hardships, man, that we so often miss as believers, gosh, we're living on the other side of this, 180 degrees from this. But I believe we go through hardships because he wants you to engage with other believers. God uses hardships to engage us in the body of Christ. You know, what tends to happen in our lives and in the people we minister to is that we often pull away from people when there's a hardship and a temptation. When, when there's a hardship in our lives, especially here in my heart right here, because a lot of you are going through a season of grief right now. Listen to me. You see this in those who grieve. J- just think of many ways this appears where there's been a, a, a loss, bereavement. You, you suffered in that way. You, just, you don't want to be around people. You don't want to be around people because they're going to say things that really aren't that helpful. Like, how are you doing? Well, I just lost a kid. You tell me. How are you doing? People mean well, but so often the wrong thing just jumps out of our mouths at the wrong time. We don't mean anything. We mean the best, but for someone who's really struggling, it hurts.
What do you say? Well, then you're supposed to say the right thing, right? If you say something when somebody says, how are you doing? Those of you who are grieving, you know I'm talking to you. You know exactly what you're feeling in this hardship because somebody says, how are you doing? And, and you, you know, how do you answer that when you're going through the situation you're going through? What do you say? You know, you're supposed to say the right thing because if you say, I'm doing horrible right now and life sucks. You're worried about what they're going to say. You can say that to your best friend. But you're not going to say that in Sunday school class. You're going to put on a smile and leave just as broken as you walked in. It doesn't fly on Sunday morning sometimes, does it? It's hard to get up and, and put on a suit. Here's the problem. When we get to that point, those of you who are grieving, hear me when I say... The Lord wants you to engage with the body of Christ. When we don't engage, we isolate ourselves from the one, from one of the means of grace God has given us. Tri trials can tempt us and pull us away, but one of God's answers to your hardship is the body of Christ. It's the body of Christ. You're, you're familiar with Romans 12 and 15, right? The apostle urges us to, to rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. What, what does this mean? What does this look like? Rejoice with those who rejoice. I believe he's telling us, I want the body to be part of that. I don't want you to be isolated. He goes on to tell us in 1 Corinthians 12, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. He wants you to not be isolated, but to engage these hardships. can cause us to engage with the body of Christ. Most often when we, when we open up and engage, you know what we find? I'm going to share some things that I found out as a pastor in the last few weeks. When we open up and engage, we find that we are not along and that there are others who have gone through exactly the same thing. And most of the time they're sitting right beside you. When you open up and engage with things like this, You open up about situations that you've gone through. You find out somebody says, you know, our son or daughter is struggling with exactly the same thing. People don't want to talk about hurts and pregnancy loss or miscarriage. But when they do, guess what happens? Guess what happens? Somebody beside them says, I went through the same thing. I know what that pain feels like. I know how it hurts. I had the same thing. One time I heard someone even as you can take a, a gasp of air if you, if you so desire because maybe you've never done this, but I'm just going to be very, very transparent with you. Even once in the moment, someone who was so broken that said, I can't believe I had an abortion. But because they engaged into a congregation, there were others who felt exactly the same way, who helped them walk through that guilt and that shame and that hurt that Satan kept them bound in. So when the hardship hits, I believe he wants you to engage with the body of Christ. The fifth thing I want you to see is I believe when hardships, they happen for a reason. I believe God uses hardships to exhibit or to display Christ's work in us to other people. I believe, could it, could it be, I just asked this morning, could it be that God allows you to face this hardship so that the light of Christ within you can shine into somebody else's life? You ever thought about that? It's real easy to say that. We talk about testimonies. A minute ago, Jim, when she was leading worship, she was talking about your testimony, the power of your testimony. As a matter of fact, Revelation says it's through the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. Your testimony is powerful. But if you are never willing to let God exhibit that or put it on display, then how good will it be in somebody else's life? 
In the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, where it says, you are the salt of the earth. Verse 14, it says, you are the light of the world. Then he says in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Have you looked at a mature Christian? We have several of them in this room. Have you looked at those mature Christians who have gone through suffering and said, how is that person still able to come to church and love the Lord after what happened in their life? How is that person able? They've endured so much. How were they able to come and be a part of of anything to do with God? How could they ever possibly do this? That's why I love worship like it was. I can stand beside some of you in the room right now. I even shared this with several of you last week at the Pastor Appreciation. And I told several of you that your life, your hardships, watching you go through some of the most difficult things in your life have inspired me and fueled me. I love to stand in worship with my hands raised beside somebody who's really walked through hell, if you will. And they hung on to the Lord. They hung on to Him. And they're hanging on to him today. And there's several of us in the room who had every right in their mind to walk away, but God said, no, no, no. You're not walking away from me. I know where your son is. I know where your daughter is. I know about your loss and your hurt. I know all those things. But you still held on. You still held on. And I believe this morning... God wants to put that on display. And for some of you, he has put it on display. If nobody else in this world sees it, you better know that I see it. You better know that my wife sees it. You better know that my kids have seen it. And I believe because you're willing to be vulnerable and let God in a hardship, let it put that hardship on display, I believe your light is shining so bright in the lives of so many other people. And listen to me, we won't ever know until we get in glory. And I don't know if he'll do it or not, but wouldn't it just be cool if he says all of a sudden, hey, look over there at the big screen, and you look over there and every one of the lives that you thought you never had any kind of an impact on, one by one, one by one, you see their face. One after another, you see their face because of your hardship they're there in heaven I want you to think about how powerful that would be in that moment I believe we go through hardships because God wants to put you on display but man we don't like nobody knowing our business do we man I thank God this morning for people who are willing to worship some of you that I know were in here worshiping a minute ago and I'll be on the stage watching you worship I'm telling you what You've helped my soul most every Sunday. Knowing what you've gone through and you persevered. The sixth thing I want you to see this morning. I believe we go through these hardship ties right into this fifth one. But the sixth thing we see this morning real quickly is. I believe we go through them because God wants to equip us. I believe he wants to equip us. I believe God is using our hardships to equip us for the ministry. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. Man, so many people stop right there, but you cannot stop right there. You have to finish out the verse. He comforts us in all our affliction. Why does he do it? so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Going through hardship, Pastor, you don't understand. Well, I'm trying to help you understand this morning because we go through them too. We all do. But the sooner we could possibly see that the Lord wants to equip you He's not calling you to be a pastor. He's calling to put your life on display to equip you because the affliction that you've went through and you found comfort, somebody wants to know where you got that from. Somebody wants to know who that is. Somebody don't know the name of Jesus. They don't know to speak the name Jesus, but you do. You know how to speak his name. How did you get through it, Jesus? What did you do after that, Jesus? But, but what about the next day, man? It was Jesus. 
You mean that's where you found your comfort? You, you mean I've watched you lose three, three people, the closest three people to your life. I've watched you bury children. I've watched you go through the hardship. I've watched you be falsely accused. I've watched all these things, and you're telling me what got you through all this was Jesus. That's what I'm telling you. You're telling me that you can't see a hardship. Man, what would happen if all of us was just speaking the name Jesus? What could it look like? We keep waiting on a revival to happen like they had on Azusa Street and all these other great revivals way back in the day. We don't think those things are for us. I'm just telling you that's contrary to what we were singing a minute ago. If we really believe he can heal our land, he wasn't talking to lost people. He said, if my people who are called by my name would seek my face and pray, then... Man, he's equipping you. This hardship can equip you to speak the name Jesus. Somebody that needs comfort. How true is the word this morning? So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. Do you know that I don't care what kind of affliction there are in anybody's life this morning? I guarantee you there is somebody in this service who has gone through exactly the same thing. Without a doubt. Without a doubt they have. There's too many people in this room that we don't have it all covered. And that shouldn't lead your mind to start wondering who's had this and who's done that. I'm just telling you, I believe the body of Christ, when it gets in sync and in tune with the Holy Spirit, not only do I believe that every gift will be in operation in a church, I also believe that everything you've come through that will help somebody else will be in the church too because that's just as powerful as, as a gift at times. Matter of fact, it is a gift to the one who's receiving that wisdom and knowledge, who's receiving that comfort. It's a gift. Man, God has changed our lives by grace. As we're learning the sufficiency of grace in our own lives, we bring hope to others, but we do so with more wisdom and compassion because we've been there. He comforts us in all of, he comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble. I don't have the same experiences that some of you had. But man, so many of you have helped me through so many of our hardships because of the experiences you went through and you were willing to let God use it. The last thing I want to share with you, get the worship team to come on up. I believe God uses our hardships to excite us. Somebody's going to say, Pastor John, there's some irony with that. I believe God uses our hardships to excite us. I don't know if I can read this one without crying. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven for God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be no mourning, no crying, no pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God, of the Lamb, and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb of God will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They'll need no light or lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. I don't know about you this morning, but sometimes we get our minds off of the hardship and we can get excited about there's coming a day. There's coming a day. 
And if you think about that, this 1 John 3, 2, it says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when it does appear, we're going to be like Him. Amen. We're going to be like Him because we shall see Him as He is. Pastor, what do you mean I can get excited? Every tear on that day is going to be wiped away. Every hurt. Man, can you imagine when you get to see Jesus? Do you know what you're not going to be thinking about? You're not going to think about that season that was the most difficult 40 years of your life. You're not going to be thinking about that time. When your marriage was on the rocks worse than it ever was and you persevered, fought like with everything you had to keep it together, you're not going to be thinking about that. You're going to be looking at the one who paid it all. And this morning, those of you who've been around me any length of time, You know that my favorite book is the book of James. You know, you start thinking about eternal matters as you age. And there's your ultimate hope for trials and hardships. Something you can get excited about, a new heaven and a new earth. Seeing people who have already gone on, however that looks. All the promises... Listen to what the scripture says in James 1.12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. First and second Thessalonians and Matthew 24 and 25 and all, all three of the main gospels all predicting Christ's return all in the context of suffering when he comes back during suffering. Revelation, we just read that. If, if we're going to just go through our knowledge of our passage about the passages about the return of Christ, you're going to see that it's in the context of suffering. Every one of those passages And hear my heart this morning. There is no final answer in this life for some hardships. You you don't have a guarantee of physical healing in this life. You don't have the guarantee that the husband will come back. You don't have the guarantee that your kid's going to repent. You don't have those guarantees. But what you do have, what you do have are strong and even more glorious guarantees. And we got to set our eyes on those things. We got to focus not on the hardship, but on the heaven that's promised to us. And today, don't misinterpret what I'm saying to you. I just want you to see what hardships might can look like from a different perspective. When we take that difficult season, instead of making it all about us, we surround ourselves with a body of believers 